an interview with Jennifer Michael Hecht, author of Stay, next on The Atheist Viewpoint. Hello, welcome to the Atheist Viewpoint. I'm your host, Dave Moscato, Public Relations Director for American Atheists. Joining me today as co-host is Dennis Horvitz, also with American Atheists. And our guest today is Jennifer Michael Hecht, who is the author of a couple of books. Um, she's the author of uh, Doubt, A History, The Great Doubters and Their Legacy of Innovation, from Socrates and Jesus to Thomas Jefferson and Emily Dickinson, this book here. And uh, she's also the author of a newer book called Stay, A History of Suicide and the Philosophies Against It, this book, uh, which is the one we're going to be talking about today. So the subject of, of today's show uh, is, is an important one. It's a difficult one to talk about. And this is a sensitive topic for a lot of people. So I want to, uh, to put out a, a trigger warning about this episode. Um, if you are someone who is sensitive to this topic, I don't want you to feel like you have to watch it. Um, I, I don't want to upset anyone, but I also think that this is a topic that's very important and we're going to be going over some information I think will be very useful to you and that I think people should hear. If you are actively suicidal, I want you to get help. I want you to talk to somebody about that. There is a national toll-free hotline that you can call for crisis counseling. They are happy to talk to you and they are trained in how to talk about these types of issues and help. That number is one 800 273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. And if you need to talk to somebody, please call that number now. Um, so let's get on with the show. Our guest today, Jennifer Michael Hecht, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, it's really, really Glad wonderful to, to have you. So let's start a little bit about your background. So your, your doctorate is in the history of science. Right. But uh, your main interest, I understand, um, from looking at your work, uh, is poetry. Um, so how did that happen? Uh, well, um, the, the first thing I was sure of was the poetry. I, I knew I wanted to write poetry. I loved reading poetry. Uh, and um, my, my father's a professor of physics mm -hmm. and um, it looked like he was home to had time to write a lot and so I thought that that academia was an interesting way to go and I really um, thought I was going to study cultural history mm -hmm. when I got to Columbia um, for my PhD they were uh, they didn't have a cultural historian they kept saying they were going to hire one and in that time what they never did hire one and I uh, took a history of science course and I really fell in love with it it's very similar kinds of thinking where you're um, you, you the imagination is a really uh, important part of how the history of science is done. You're feeling around for things and for relationships. And um, yeah, it reminded me of what I love most um, I I in poetry. And so I, I've, and, and by now uh, I'm as you know, deeply committed and in love with these questions and ways of, of looking at them. Great, that's wonderful. Um, so uh, you currently teach at the new school in, in New York City. Yep. Um, I, I met you originally in uh, in 2012 at Reason Fest mm -hmm. uh, in Kansas uh, at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, and actually that's where I got uh, this this specific book. Mm -hmm. This doubt um, you signed a copy of this for me. So um, yeah, I, that was a, a wonderful talk that you gave uh, you. about this, and uh, we had I, I don't know if you remember, but we had a conversation afterward about. Uh, statistical confidence versus faith and how mm -hmm. people sometimes equivocate those and right. uh, very enlightening so thank you for that um, yeah so uh, I, I've been a fan of your stuff for for some years now 
Um, and uh, the reason I brought you on today is uh, uh, Robin Williams. I would yeah. say that's yeah. I mean, that's what prompted all of this. I heard you on on Brian Lear's show last week, right? Um, and that that was a good interview. I think um, there was a, a caller that disturbed me a lot, right? Um, and I, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, right? Um, so I want to I want to talk about that kind of thing, but um, this is uh, this is something this topic. This is something that affects a, a huge number of people. Yeah. And the the point that you're really making, I think, and I don't want to speak for you, is that this doesn't just affect the people that it directly affects. Right. But it affects many, many other people too. Right. Um, and um, that's that's really the issue here. So, talk to me about that. Exactly. Uh, the 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 argument in the the book is that there are secular reasons to reject suicide. That the notion that suicide is a, a, a kind of pillar of our autonomy, that it's a necessary right that we have to have. Uh, that is a very historically specific argument and when you put it in a much larger historical context it looks very different and you start to be able to see the arguments that other cultures have uh, have cherished and repeated, but that really got knocked out of our conversation because of a, a kind of a turf war uh, between um, the, the church's sort of draconian response to suicide and the Enlightenment's attempt to stop that brutality, because they were, the church was torturing corpses and confiscating the estate, so the family was destitute. Yeah. It worked. We, did, we do have some records of people, lots of records for a, a millennia of people saying, you know, that the devil was tempting them to suicide and they imagined God as trying to pull them out. And they tell of how they survived because they had this imagery. So in some ways, you know, that was helpful, but A, I don't believe it. And so, you know, m m even a lot of believers now don't believe in the religious arguments against. Uh, we see that all the time in suicide notes mm -hmm. of God will forgive me, he knows what, right. you know, that right. kind of thing. Right. So the secular argument against it seemed so important to just bring out and get on the table, um, have it at least sit next to the argument that you can do whatever you want. And that the, the, the main uh, secular arguments through history and the ones that I find most powerful are the argument of community, which, which is with suicide that you, you don't just, you devastate the people around you, but also we can now show with statistics, and we have over and over again, that a suicide in a school raises the rate of suicide, uh, suicide in that school in a lot of the time, right? So it's not always, and preventative things seem to help. Good talk is better than no talk, mm -hmm. but bad talk is worse, so you really have to be a little bit careful. Could you give us an example of what you would consider bad talk? Well, the response to Robin Williams a little bit, we, we don't know how people respond to the new social media, but we do know that for at least two decades, um, it was the Surgeon General C. Everett Koop who said, look, we've proven this. Suicide is influential, especially right. with young people. So, so here are some guidelines for the media. And most major media holds to these guidelines without any outside pressure. It's just this notion that, for instance, don't use the word suicide in the headline and don't say the method even in the body of the mm -hmm. text. And there are other recommendations. Don't show a photograph of the event, a show, per, show image of them earlier. Then there are some that are controversial, uh, some that suggest that we talk about it in terms of mental illness. I'm not sure that's helpful. The more I look at the statistics, the more I see that a lot of suicide is, is by people who are perhaps not the most depressed, but that it's impulsive. Mm -hmm. And when you somehow get through that bad night, you have a very good chance of yeah. staying alive. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna Yes, touch I'm on sorry, touch on that a little bit more. Off. Sure, um, that I think that's a very important point that I want to spend some time on. Is that uh, I think many people uh, I don't have statistics on this. Maybe you do have have fleeting suicidal ideation. Right. And um, I think I, I don't know if it's most people, but certainly many people have those thoughts. I bet it's sometimes. just over half. I've yeah. I, I give it an, a little education, and mm -hmm. that's my guess. Yeah. And I, I think it's fair to say that. Uh, making it more difficult for somebody to carry out suicide dramatically drops 
the success, r I don't want to yes, call it, it success rate, but you know what I mean. The uh, completion rate, right, yeah. yes. And uh, when we're talking about like, well, I mean, just this year in, in June uh, on the Golden Gate Bridge when they installed mm -hmm. these nets, they've had the signs up for quite a while that yeah. says, you know, crisis counseling and yeah. you know, there is hope and they have the phones that you can call. But um, just d distracting somebody or, or delaying it or making it more difficult for them yes. to carry it out. Often that is enough because Absolutely. in the 90s, yeah. the, the mm -hmm. UK took acetaminophen out of bulk. Right. Put it in bubble packs and only sold six at a time, and the suicide rate went down because mm -hmm. that that method had been shown on uh, some television. Uh, that is, that method had had exploded a little bit, and mm -hmm. it just the genie went back in the bottle. Um, the Sylvia Plath method; they mm -hmm. changed the ovens, and the suicide rate went down. So we know that that's true. Mm -hmm. My particular taste is to offer this to people to protect themselves rather than others. Though I'm glad other people are making that argument, but I I, I like to, to really say, you know, all of us, when we're in our best place, we need to make ourselves a note and, uh, and try to remember that these other moods exist. It was Emerson who said our moods do not believe in each other. Mm -hmm. And when you're one of, these, one of the people, and I am, if I get very down, or even sometimes I don't even know I'm down, and those thoughts do come to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, and, and, th and this research that I've done and the talking to the people that I've done because of it has changed my life. It's made that a very much a different experience. Based on your understanding, <coughs> would you, because uh, you've just, you just mentioned that n not everybody that commits suicide is necessarily long term That's right. uh, under depression. But I, I, I think it would be fair to say that perhaps the bulk of people that do commit suicide. Are By definition, under. once you commit suicide, you weren't happy, right? So I, I think that it's a little tautological. So, pe so the, the profession, the experts very often say th that a lot of people weren't diagnosed, but we can say that they were. Well, mm. I don't have a definition of depression that makes that useful right. to well, me. Well, my point being that um, one of the characteristics of, of, of depression, even minor depression, is that this is never going to That's end. That's right, that you can't see out of it. Absolutely. You can't right. see your way mm -hmm. out of it. We uh, need to know that that's a symptom and circumvent it. When you're feeling better, find ways to remind yourself so that Wittgenstein said, and he was sort of, he was sort of uh, riffing off something Schopenhauer said, you know, uh, uh, over a century earlier, that we always, that suicide is always a kind of taking, rushing your defenses, taking yourself by surprise, and that that's always a kind of terrible thing. You should always, like, if you sense, oh, this part of me that knows it's not the right thing, and I think we've all experienced it, you do it anyway. Um, but you can make rules about things you don't do anyway. And I think in our society, nobody has to do the first thinking about homicide. You can think, somebody upstages you, somebody takes something that's yours, and you just do think for a second, gosh, I'd like to take that. And, but your brain isn't considering it. But nobody, w our culture hasn't done that work for us with suicide in a way that it really should, especially when we teach every college student who comes through a, even a Western Civ, let alone a philosophy class, we teach them about this idea of suicide being this right that we have, this, this, this autonomous. We must at least teach the other side of it, which right. is the vast majority of philosophers. Even Socrates, who's the famous suicide, he, in mm. that room, before he drank the hemlock, he said, I've been ordered to do this by trial. You may not do this. He tells his friends and his students, suicide is wrong. Uh, Plato says it's wrong. Aristotle says it wrong. Most of them for the communitarian reasons. But then you get to someone like Camus who talks about your future self. Uh, not in those words, but, but who believes the future self. And there are met, more philosophers argue the reject suicide because of the community. Um, but a bunch of them also say, your future self may know things that you don't know. As a matter of fact, we can almost guarantee it. So mm -hmm. give them at least enough respect to not kill them. And the statistics definitely uh, show that uh, someone who's had a suicide in the family. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, right. And definitely more humans. Absolutely. We're, we're such For two generations. Yeah. We're such social animals that we really That's depend right. on each other in a way that, that not many other animals really do like that. Um, I mean, it's not just that we work together in groups. I mean, you know, lions and fish and other animals do that too, but we, we depend on each other emotionally in a and way we, that and I we don't contemplate yeah. our own existence. Mm -hmm. which yeah. is and, and we have the, the uh, concept of what we're doing if we're contemplating suicide that uh, I don't think any other animal really right. grasps this, this uh, right. 
definiteness of the end of it. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a line. In, uh, actually, this comes from the blog post that that um, was the foundation for the book. But uh, this is a, a controversial line um, that you said uh, one of the best predictors of suicide is knowing a suicide. That I think we all agree on. Then you said that means that suicide is also delayed homicide. Yeah. And I think, and I'm I'm gonna I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, but I'm, this is a devil's advocate thing. Um, I, the correlation is there, no question. The causation, I, it's, I mean, it's a matter of statistics. Right. But what do you think about how that would play into the argument of free will for other people in saying that sure. no, that's this is, is that taking away the idea that they are choosing this for themselves? Yeah. Um, well, let's put this in, in context. I think that um, we follow each other's behavior to a tremendous degree. So we're always influencing each other. And we do that for better and worse all the time. And it is certainly um, a somewhat metaphorical statement to say that a suicide is also kind of a delayed homicide. Okay. Nonetheless, uh, I did make it up, but then I found Victor Hugo saying mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, that the moment suicide touches someone else, which is immediately, uh, it's, it's, it's also a homicide. Um, and I definitely saw that relationship described throughout history and only now um, put into statistics. And I think that there is more, more than statistics to it too because we have the experiences that we can talk about. That is, after a suicide of someone close to you, um, people report a different kind of ideation. Um, and I, I've, I, I've done a lot of reading about that and, and experienced it in some ways. I, I, I understand um, so many different ways that that can happen, that it just seems like a better, it seems like an idea that's on the table. Now, whether or not speaking in ways that are going to um, inflame people a little bit is sometimes a good way to get a new idea on the table. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, for some people, it's not going to work. I, I, I have to say I've, been, I've experienced more anger for this book than by writing about atheism um, by a hundredfold. Really? Absolutely. Okay. So religious people, even though they understand, though some, I am contacted by people who love the book who think I was neutral in doubt. But the vast majority of people understand that I'm completely on doubt side, and indeed doubt is a gentle word for atheist. That mm -hmm. is the version of, of thinker that I celebrate the most, that I, that I love, and that I identify myself as, as somebody who, um, yeah, beyond agnostic or not, I, I feel that looking at the natural world as it is, looking at the other animals, looking at our situation in space, all of that, and looking at history. I mean, I know that Superman is an invented idea because I know about the time before him, and I know who invented him and when and what was going on, and I know the same things about the afterlife. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mo the vast majority of human history has not believed in a god. There have been millions of Confucians who didn't believe in a god or an afterlife as such. The the number of Theravada Buddhists who have, that is, right. it's become so clear that this is just one little cultural blip and we're all living in a hangover from it, constantly saying, wow, we the loss of God. Come on, there's lots of ways of being human. And if you, the, the larger your cosmological and, and naturalist and historical understanding, it seems to me, the more that you don't feel like you need to entertain this idea because it's been suggested. Mm -hmm. um, so. For me, uh, the, the questions that the atheist worldview brings up are the questions for me. That's the meaning of life. Those are the real questions. So I'm not really doing the battleground argument about what else one might think. So what is being a human being? Mm -hmm. And what is the, the line that comes, that I, I wrote it, and I, I, I'm constantly quoting it, uh, though it's odd to quote oneself, it, that the feeling of meaning is sufficient to the definition of meaning. I believe that the feeling of love is sufficient to the definition of love, right? Sometimes you feel love, sometimes you don't, but you don't start believing maybe it doesn't exist just because you're not in it at the moment. Mm -hmm. You remember it keenly from when you did, and you see it around you. 
and you can read about it. I believe that the feeling of meaning is equally as fleeting, equally as problematic, but that there's no way you can prove to me that love doesn't exist, and there's no way you can prove to me that meaning doesn't exist, because I never leaned on God for meaning anyway. So mm -hmm. when you took that wall away, I didn't fall down. Yeah. I was leaning on art, I was leaning on culture, and I was leaning on this strange, weird experience of human consciousness. Mm -hmm. And th these things to me are real and there, and they're different than the chemical reaction of salt, on, you know, but they are, uh, they are also not things that um, I need to discuss whether they're real. So what, if meaning is real because of its feelings, what kind of parameters can we give this? And it's very similar to talking about morality. I'm doing a different talk, I'm doing a different conversation with you than I do anywhere because usually I'm mostly talking about suicide. And quite frankly here, I'm talking about atheism and suicide mm -hmm. because I want to talk about it. Because right. to me, it's, it is the crucial part that got a little bit shoved to the side because people needed this, this conversation about suicide. And because I don't want the believers to kill themselves either. Right. So I, no, no. I, I right? So I mm -hmm. let the conversation be, but I always insist that it's secular. Yeah. I always point that out. Um, and, uh, and I get a little bit more flack from the non-believing community because I'm going against our uh, program. Mm -hmm. um, but the only way that you keep a, 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 a humanist of philosophy alive or any other philosophy is by going against the program and looking right. into it and saying what's useful here and what, what, how are we basing things. And I very much want to encourage the conversation about what right. secular mor morality is. It certainly isn't nothing, because I don't believe God made up morality, so there's no reason I have to stop talking about morality just because you no longer believe in God. I didn't before, I don't now, and I still need to talk about morality. Yeah, I think, um, and, and you talk about this too, the, the idea that this is uh, kind of a taboo subject of, of suicide, just generally speaking, and that's, that's not a healthy way to talk about this type of thing. Right. Um, and, and there is kind of a leftover um, idea that, uh, that suicide is bad from religion, even among atheists, sure. um, just because of the cultural influence of, of Christianity, particularly in the United States, but religion generally being against it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's necessary for us to talk about secular morality in order to have this conversation, yeah. um, not just for atheists, but just generally speaking, because there, there isn't a God, so yeah. <laughs> we should have a good secular <laughs> argument for this. Can I just, uh, just yeah. I just wanna jump back a little bit. Um, we were talking, you know, you're talking about how you know the um, the uh, I guess the ripple effect. You know, mm -hmm. would you say just? Uh, I, I mean, I know you're not a psychologist, but mm -hmm. would you say that there's a similarity between, say, uh, copycat crimes mm -hmm. and and I don't know, maybe I'm being insensitive by calling them copycat suicides. No, that's a Do phrase that people use, and uh, I think that 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 that's uh, astute. I think. Um, it's it's not one of the ones you see compared a lot, but it's uh, it's just as as uh, clear that 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 kind of relationship goes on. Uh, I do think suicide is is a little is more influential than a lot of things. But when you start, our culture is so has such an idea of individualized independence that no culture before could ever afford. Right. We, mm -hmm. Through most of history, there was one good fireplace in each house, and no matter how annoying the other people were, you, you were in the same room with them because it was warm. And you know, when it was hot, you went on the front porch. And, and we are not different from other people in that we want to get away, but we have things to keep ourselves amused and climate controlled, and our own rooms in the 1950s for the first time uh, w we could say, you know, only in the U.S., that there were more rooms than people in most uh, abodes. Uh, right. that's, so we are so lonely, so alienated, without, by choice, because we like it better, but we're not taking care of some of the things we need to mm -hmm. be okay. And uh, that, and, and, uh, but I just, I, I just want to say that, that smoking and the way you exercise or don't exercise or, um, or whether you have a third child or only one or none, a, a lot of these we can see the social ripples mm -hmm. so that it, we're blinded to it because of our independence, but when we look for it, boy, yeah. is it there. I, I hate to, to I'm sorry, cut this here. Um, it's, uh, we actually need to wrap up the show. Um, uh, there's, we could go on about this for you a know, long time. You know, I was just saying, we've got, we've got to yeah. have you back just I, to discuss I would love, I would all love these to other philosophical. Um, yeah, yeah this, this is a, a good conversation. Oh, uh, um, an embarrassment of yeah. riches, in yes, fact. Yes, very much. So. 
Um, I, uh, so um, I just wanted to say, um, again, we've, uh, we've been talking about this sensitive subject of suicide. And um, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that this, uh, that this discussion can go, a lot of interesting places it can go. The book, again, uh, by Jennifer Michael Hecht is called Stay, A History of Suicide and the Philosophies Against It. Again, if you are actively suicidal, please seek help. Please call somebody. The number is 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Um, our guest today, again, uh, Jennifer Michael Hecht, thank you so much for thank joining us today. Thank You've you been watching The Atheist Viewpoint, where reason reigns and reality rules. We'll see you next week. Thank bye you. Bye. Quite well, but we're not falling anymore.